page 273 continued. John Ruskin, J O H N, Ruskin, R U S K I N, 1819 to 1900. Para, in approaching the study of Ruskin, we are to remember, first of all, that we are dealing with a great and good man who is himself more inspiring than any of his books. In some respects, he is like his friend Carlyle, whose disciple he acknowledged himself to be. But he is broader in his sympathies and in every way more hopeful, helpful and human. Thus, in the face of the drudgery and poverty of the competitive system, Carlyle proposed with the grim satire of Swift's quote, modest proposal, unquote, comma, to organize an annual hunt in which successful people should shoot the unfortunate and to use the game for the support of the army and navy. Ruskin, facing the same problem, wrote, quote, I will endure it no longer quietly, semicolon, but henceforward, comma, with any few or many who will help, comma, do my best to abate this misery, stop, unquote. Then, leaving the field of art criticism where he was the acknowledged leader, he begins to write of labor and justice, gives his fortune in charity, in establishing schools and libraries, and founds his St. George's Guild of Workingmen to put in practice the principles of brotherhood and cooperation for which he and Carlyle contended. Though his style marks him as one of the masters of English prose, he is generally studied not as a literary man but as an ethical teacher, and we shall hardly appreciate his works unless we see behind every book the figure of the heroically sincere man who wrote it. Para Works of Ruskin There are three little books which in popular favor stand first on the list of Ruskin's numerous works. Ethics of the Dust, a series of lectures to little housewives, which appeals most to women. Though his style marks him as one of the masters of English prose, he is generally studied not as a literary man but as an ethical teacher, and we shall hardly appreciate his works unless we see behind every book the figure of the heroically sincere man who wrote it. Para. Works of Ruskin. There are three little books which, in popular favor, stand first on the list of Ruskin's numerous works. Ethics of the Dust, a series of lectures to little housewives, which appeals most to women, Crown of the Wild Olive, three lectures, page 274, on work, Traffic and War, which appeals to thoughtful men facing the problems of work and duty, and Sizem and Lilies, which appeals to men and women alike. The last is the most widely known of Ruskin's works and the best with which to begin our reading, para. The first thing we notice in Sizem and Lilies is the symbolical title, stop, quote, Sizem, S-C-S-A-M-E, comma, unquote, taken from the story of the robber's cave in the Arabian Nights, means a secret word or talisman which unlocks a treasure house. It was intended, no doubt, to introduce the first part of the work, comma, called, quote, of King's Treasure, comma, unquote, which treats of books and reading, quote, Lily's, unquote, taken from Isaiah, I-S-A-I-A-H, as a symbol of beauty, purity, and peace, introduces the second lecture, quote, of Queen's Gardens, unquote, which is an exquisite study of woman's life and education. These two lectures properly constitute the book, but a third is added on, quote, the mystery of life, stop, unquote. The last begins in a monologue upon his own failures in life 
and is pervaded by an atmosphere of sadness, sometimes of pessimism, quite different from the spirit of the other two lectures, stop, para. Though the theme of the first lecture is books, Ruskin manages to present to his audience his whole philosophy of life. He gives us, with a wealth of detail, a description of what constitutes a real book. He looks into the meaning of words and teaches us how to read, using a selection from Milton's Lycidas as an illustration. The study of words gives us the key with which we are to unlock, quote, kings, treasuries, unquote, that is the books which contain the precious thoughts of the kingly minds of all ages. He shows the real meaning and end of education, the value of labor, and of a purpose in life. He treats of nature, science, art, literature, religion. He defines the purpose of government, showing that soul life, not money or trade, is the measure of national greatness. And he criticizes the general injustice of his age, quoting a heart-rending story of toil and suffering from the newspapers to show how close his theory is to daily needs. Here is an astonishing variety in a small compass, but here there is no confusion. Ruskin's mind was wonderfully analytical and one subject develops naturally from the other. Para. In the second lecture, quote, of Queen's Gardens, unquote, he considers the question of woman's place and education, which Tennyson had attempted to answer in The Princess. Ruskin's theory is that the purpose of all education is to acquire power, to bless and to redeem human society, and that in this noble work, woman must always play the leading part. He searches all literature for illustrations and his description of literary heroines, especially of Shakespeare's perfect women, is unrivaled. Ruskin is always at his best in writing of women or for women and the lofty idealism of this essay, together with its rare beauty of expression, makes it on the whole the most delightful and inspiring of his works. Para. Among Ruskin's practical works, the reader will find in Fors, F-O-R-S, Clavigera, C-L-A-V-I-G-E-R-A, a series of letters to working men, and unto this last, four essays on the principles of political economy, the substance of his economical, economic teachings. In the latter work, starting with the proposition that our present competitive system centers about the idea of wealth, Ruskin tries to find out what wealth is. And the pith, P-I-T-H, of his teaching is this, that men are of more account than money, that a man's real wealth is found in his soul, not in his pocket, and that the prime object of life and labor is, quote, the producing of as many as possible, full-breathed, comma, bright-eyed, comma, and happy-hearted human creatures, top, unquote. To make this idea practical, ideal practical, Ruskin makes four suggestions. One, that training schools be established to teach young men and women three things, the laws and practice of health, habits of gentleness and justice, and the trade or calling by which they are to live. Two, that the government establish farms and workshops for the production of all the necessities of life, where only good and honest work shall be tolerated, and where a standard of work and wages shall be maintained. Three, that any person out of employment shall be received at the nearest government school, if ignorant, he shall be educated, and if comp competent to do any work, he shall have the opportunity to do it. 4. That comfortable homes be provided for the sick and for the aged, and that this be done in justice, nor in charity. 
A laborer serves his country as truly as does a soldier or a statesman, and a pension should be no more disgraceful in one case than in the other. Para. Among Ruskin's numerous books treating of art, we recommend The Seven Lamps of Architecture, 1849, Stones of Venice, 1851-53, and the first two volumes of Modern Painters, 1843-1846. With Ruskin's art theories, which, as Sidney Smith prophesied, comma, quote, worked a complete revolution in the world of taste, comma, unquote, we need not concern ourselves here. Page 275. We simply point out four principles that are manifest in all his work. One, that the object of art as of every other human endeavor is to find and to express the truth. Two, that art in order to be true must break away from conventionalities and copy nature. Three, that morality is closely allied with art and that a careful study of any art reveals the moral strength or weakness of the people that produced it. Four, that the main purpose of art is not to delight a few cultured people, but to serve the daily uses of common life. Quote, the giving brightness to pictures is much, unquote, he says, quote, but the giving brightness to life is more, stop, unquote. In this attempt to make art serve the practical ends of life, Ruskin is allied with all the great writers of the period who used literature as the instrument of human progress. Para. General Characteristics One who reads Ruskin is in a state of mind analogous to that of a man who goes through a picture gallery, pausing now to admire a face or a landscape for its own sake and again to marvel at the technical skill of the artist without regard to his subject. For Ruskin is a great literary artist and a great ethical teacher, and we admire one page for its style and the next for its message to humanity. The best of his prose which one may find in the descriptive passages of Preterita, P-R-A-E-T-E-R-I-T-A, -E -E and Modern Painters, is written in a richly ornate style with a wealth of figures and illusions, and at times a rhythmic, melodious quality which makes it almost equal to poetry. Ruskin had a rare sensitiveness to beauty in every form, and more perhaps than any other writer in our language, he has helped us to see and appreciate the beauty of the world around us. Para, as for Ruskin's ethical teaching, it appears in so many forms and in so many different works that any summary must appear inadequate. For a full half century he was, quote, the apostle of beauty, unquote, in England, and the beauty for which he pleaded was never sensuous or pagan, as in the Renaissance, but always spiritual, appealing to the soul of man rather than to his eyes, leading to better work and better living. In his economic aces, Ruskin is even more directly and positively ethical. To mitigate the evils of the unreasonable competitive system under which we labor and sorrow, to bring master and man together in mutual trust and helpfulness, to seek beauty, truth, goodness as the chief ends of life, and having found them to make our characters correspond, to share the best treasures of art and literature with rich and poor alike, to labor always and whether we work with hand or head, to do our work in praise of something that we love. This sums up Ruskin's purpose and message. And the best of it is that, like Chaucer's country person, P.A.R.S.O.N., he practiced his doctrine before he preached it.